Thank you, Donna Kay. Thank you all for, for coming here, and I hope that I can uh, give you some information that you will find useful uh, as you start or continue your small ruminant enterprises. Um, I've had a sheep and goat practice where I treated sick animals, and that was where I uh, came to the realization that I could do better for my clients than what I was doing. <clears throat> and so that started me on the path of where I am now, which is working with producers uh, on wellness programs to keep their animals healthy. But many years ago, I was very fortunate to get to hear Mike Caskey speak. Um, he spoke via teleconference uh, to the Southwest Missouri Sheep Association, of which I was a member at that time and helped organize this talk. And so um, he's been a wealth of information for a very long time, and I've implemented some of the things that he has talked about. But today, what I want to talk to you all about, the two primary things I want you to be aware of, particularly if you are getting started in sheep and or goats, is to get good quality breeding stock. And then the second thing, as Mike alluded to several times, is that we are in the south and we have got some big advantages to where he is up in Minnesota in that we do have a lot more pasture, we have a lot more opportunity to graze. <clears throat> and we have a lot more opportunity to cut our feed costs because of that. But the downside is that we also have a lot more problem with parasites. So these are the two things that I'm really gonna focus on. Uh, all I can do is just touch on a lot of things uh, to help you start thinking about what you need to be doing on your own operation. And um, for some reason, I'm always put on after lunch. So, and especially after the lunch we had, I may have a hard time staying awake. So hopefully you all be able to. And I'm a walker also. Um, we'll see how much I stand here, but they've asked me to carry a microphone with me if I start walking around. So the, the first point I want to get across to you all is that sheep and goats don't have to get sick. They don't have to. But it's not just a matter of turning a blind eye if an animal does get sick or putting them out there and just hoping they don't get sick. It requires attention to detail and a lot of management, a lot of management skills. Management is not as costly except for your time, but it does require time. You've got to sit and think about what you're wanting to achieve. You've got to plan for what you're going to do, and then you have to monitor what you do and see how well it works. And because what we're wanting to do is to produce a quality product, we've got to think about several things. Uh, and in order to produce that quality product, then animals have got to handle the stress and remain healthy. Because we are putting them out there on land, outside for the most part, uh, and they're in the real world, so they are going to have some stresses. They've got to have the ability to pass positive traits onto their offspring. And so that goes back to getting good quality breeding stock to begin with. And then we want, to, want them to produce a wholesome, healthy product because there are lots of consumers out there. We've already been talking a lot about the ethnic market, but there's a lot of consumers out there that are uh, native-born Americans that want to know where their food comes from, and they want food raised a certain way, fed a certain way, and they also want to support local farmers. And so in order for that to be successful, we've got to provide them with a product that they will buy again. And one thing that's not in my bio, but that I should let you all know, is that I am a partner in a grass-finished beef and lamb operation. So we raise cattle and sheep and, and feed them their entire lives on nothing but grass. So I'm used to direct marketing, uh, and so I'm used to, what, to hearing what that consumer wants. Now then, just to throw out one other monkey wrench in this is that for those of you who are interested in raising goats, be aware that goats are harder to raise than sheep are, particularly in this area. Why? Because their diet preferences are different from sheep. Sheep are like cattle. They want to put their heads down and graze. Goats don't ever want to put their heads down. If they can walk along and eat just as they're walking along, that's when they're happiest. So they want browse, they want trees, they want bushes, they want tall growing plants to eat. 
which many people have. They have a lot of brushy land at first, but those goats can clear that out really quickly. And then parasites. Goats, historically, have been raised in desert climates where internal parasites do not survive very readily. And that's how they've been adapted over thousands of years. And we've been raising them here in temperate climates for about 30 years. So most of these goats have had to learn how to adapt, and many of them haven't. The animal wellness goals that I have for every producer that I work with, including myself, are to manage the system, the whole system, to keep those animals healthy. That means more than just the animals, but it means the land that those animals live on and all the inputs that we put into our land and to our animals. This is a holistic approach and requires looking at the animals and their environment together. So that means that when you go out and look at your animals, you need to be looking at them on the piece of property where they're being raised. And you've got to look at all that property too. You've got to know what's going on at the soil level. You've got to know what's going on at the plant level. And understanding that if you change one part of that system, it's all interrelated. And so you will change every part. So every time you put a fence post into the ground, you're actually having an impact on that whole farm. Anytime you put fertilizer on that land, you're having an impact on the animals. Anytime you feed those animals anything, it's going to come out in the manure and urine, which is going to have an impact. So you need to start thinking about how everything is connected to everything else. And then the second thing is to identify and reduce the stresses that affect your livestock. And in doing so, then you will prevent disease. So now then, to ensure quality control, we've got to monitor the animals and the farm constantly. And one good thing about a workshop such as this is it gives you all a chance to meet others that are in similar circumstances and similar geographic areas as you are. And so get to know different people. Go visit their farms. Have them come to visit your farm. If you've got a local veterinarian that you can work with, and I know those are becoming fewer and farther between, you need to have them come out periodically and look at your livestock. Because they will notice things that you don't because you're out there every day seeing your animals. Even if it's just some person who doesn't even have any livestock experience coming out and taking a look at your farm and oohing and on over everything, they may notice something that you wouldn't notice otherwise. Because things can happen very slowly and they can be missed by you. This right here represents your farm. And it's a, it's a closed system that's within a bigger closed system. So you have your farm, and then your farm is within your community, and your community is within your county, and so on and so forth. But if we think just about your farm, then this is going to help you understand how everything is connected to everything else. And because we raise livestock, then we're going to start with the animals at the top. The animals manure and urine feeds the soil. The soil is full of minerals, it's full of other nutrients, it's full of microbes, it's full of insects, earthworms. They feed the forages, the forages feed the animals. But one thing, particularly with small ruminants, that we can't forget about is weather. Weather can be an overriding factor on everything else. So you can have your system working extremely well. And if we go through two years of drought, like we have, especially me. I think I've had more drought up in northwest Arkansas than you all have had down here. It can wreak havoc on your whole system. And so the first thing to think about, knowing how your system is working, is to start doing an assessment. First thing to do is soil maps, soil test results. Go to your NRCS office. NRCS now has an online system to where you can actually see what kind of soil types you have and their productivity on your own farm. But you can get a map from uh, NRCS that will show you the kinds of soil types you have. And then soil test results. Uh, soil tests can be done uh, at the extension, taken into the extension office, and they will run those for you. And or you can use a private lab. Get those results back, 
Don't look at the recommendations because those recommendations may not really fit your particular system. But look at what the results are. If you don't understand what the levels of the different nutrients are, then you can go talk to either Extension or NRCS to help you understand that. So this is a baseline of what you've got on your farm, and then you can start figuring out how you can improve it or change it. Second is look at individual pastures if you're going to be doing a grazing system, which I highly recommend, uh, and nutrient analyses if you have them. So you can take forage samples and do the same thing as you do with soil tests. But you want to look at individual pastures. True, you need to have an understanding of your overall farm, but most everybody will say, oh, that area always grows better grass than that area over there. So just understanding how the different parts of your farm respond to different uh, weather changes or inputs of any kind. Yes, Todd? On the, your smartphone, they have an app called SoilWeb that will GPS wherever you're at and tell you just about all that we can tell you about the soil. And then the, the website that anybody can go on, there's Web Soil Survey, you can go on there and pick up anything that we can, most that we can pick up at our office on the soil that you're, uh, that you're concerned with. Thank you, Todd. I mean, that's really a useful application. It's Soil Web is the app, smartphone app. And then finally is animal management histories. Now, I can talk to a lot of producers and they can tell me their animal histories, such as this ewe gave me twins last year, gave me a single the year before, I weaned them on this date, I had one lamb die and one did really well. They can tell me all that information. But what I want to know is how have these animals been managed? And particularly when you are getting animals, you want them to, you want to get them from a farm that is managing them the same way that you're going to be managing them. Uh, for example, I talked to a woman yesterday who is going to get a, a single goat because she is just getting started. She's going to get a single goat to put with a guard dog that she's going to get because next spring she's going to get some sheep. And she's, got it, she's going to have it out on pasture. Well, as we talked more, uh, she told me that this goat is being raised in a pen with several other goats. And so that means I know that that goat's probably never even seen pasture. It's always been fed out of a feed sack and been fed hay. And I said, that goat will have to learn how to graze. That was a concept because she's a beginner she had never even thought of. Uh, it would be nice to think, and, and animals do have an instinct, but if they've never been outside in a pasture setting, they don't know that that stuff is to eat. They'll just look at it and walk on it and keep on walking. So animal management histories are very important. This right here is probably one of two most important slides in my whole presentation. I want you to really, really think about everything that's on here because if you do these things, you will be light years ahead when it comes to raising livestock. You will have far fewer problems. Um, when I talk about preventive health, most people think about routine uh, vaccines, deworming, medications, whatever they're, whatever they're giving to that animal. But it first starts with good animal husbandry practices, just understanding how to care for that animal on a day-to-day -day basis. And if you're a beginner, that can be hard to know how to do. That's why people are looking for all sorts of resources. And that's why everybody here, it can be a resource for everybody else because everybody has a little bit different situation. Everybody does things a little bit differently, but you have to first understand how to just raise those animals. The next one is sanitation. And Mike talked a lot about that this morning and it is so critical. The drier you can keep that animal and its environment, the healthier it's going to be. And while sanitation, good sanitation is a common sense sort of thing, I know, I know that I forget about that at times and it's really easy to forget about how important it is. And there are times when we are dealing with mud and dealing with a lot of wetness and we have to be aware of during those times that that's going to be, can cause more problems with our livestock. The next one is so crucial, but it's probably the hardest thing for people to learn, and that is good observation skills. 
The longer you're around livestock, the more you will pick up on that. But it requires time and it requires at first some conscious effort. Uh, I can go out now and, and observe my animals and it's kind of second nature. And so I know what I'm doing and I know what I'm seeing. But when you're first starting out, you're going out there and you just see a bunch of animals and you go, okay, what am I looking for? Well, I've got some slides that will hopefully help that. But the main thing you're doing is starting to see the individualness of each of your animals, how they respond to their environment, how they respond to each other, and how they respond to you. And if the more you spend time with your, your animals, the more you'll start seeing some differences, which are normal. And that's what you need to understand is what is normal for your animals so that then you can start noticing that very first change in behavior that indicates an abnormality. Because you don't want to wait to observe your animals after you go out there and find two or three dead on the ground and another four or five sick over in the corner somewhere. So get in the habit of going out and spending time with your animals, walking through them and just observing how they're different from each other. Vaccinations are certainly on the preventative health list, and I've got several slides that talk about that. And finally, quarantining new arrivals. Another common sense thing to do, but one that we forget about. We bring in new animals, and we get all excited about getting to introduce them to the rest of the herd or flock, and we forget that they need to be quarantined because they may be harboring some disease. And with sheep and goats, we need to be concerned about uh, foot rot, foot scald, and probably sore mouth. All things that may not show up right away, but after they're quarantined for a few days, you may start seeing some signs. So I like to quarantine them for about 10 days. And it doesn't need to be 100 acres apart. It just needs to be so that they are not having nose-to-nose -nose contact with the rest of the animals. And then, before you turn that those new animals in with your existing herd or flock, examine them very carefully. Make sure that they're not just starting with some eye discharge that could be uh, a sign of pink eye, uh, conjunctivitis, that they're not starting with some little scabs on the side of their mouth, which can be sore mouth, and turn them upside down or check their feet really carefully to make sure that they're not starting with foot rot or foot scald. Probably the worst problems I've ever heard were people that borrowed a ram or buck that had foot rot and they brought it onto their place. They never had foot rot before. And after about three years later, they didn't have foot rot again. So what to look for? Well, we want to look for confirmation and then signs of healthy animals. So we've got these, these, uh, this buck or this doe and then this ewe and lamb, uh, deep bodied, good hair coat, bright and alert, the sheep are grazing, just doing what we want them to do. Uh, these are what you want to look for. And when I'm buying breeding stock, I want to go to the farm. Don't ever go to a sale barn and buy breeding stock. That's where people sell their cull animals. And they're a cull because something was wrong with them. Now, I know people that buy sale barn animals, and they have good success. But those are usually very experienced livestock producers who know what they're looking for and they understand the risk that they're taking. But particularly for somebody who's doing it the first time and who doesn't have very many animals, go to that farm. First of all, you're gonna develop a relationship with the seller of those animals and you can ask them questions, you can see how they do things and you can see how the rest of their livestock look. And if they don't wanna answer your questions and they don't wanna be bothered with you after you buy some animals from them, I wouldn't give them my money. I would say thank you very much and walk away. Or if you see things that don't think you don't think will fit your system, then you're going to know about it before you take the animals and put them on your own place. So good health. I want them to be alert and lively. I want their I want them to look at me with some interest. I want their ears to be perked up. I don't want them being droopy. I like to look at the eyes of animals. I can usually tell more by looking at the eyes than anything else. I have had cows and ewes that were my best animals, and then one day they don't look at me. And that's the first sign to me that something is wrong, because they should all look at me when I go out there and take a look at them. 
Uh, cud chewing. We're dealing with sheep and goats, which are ruminants. They have a rumen. They have to regurgitate what they eat and chew their cud. If you see a goat or sheep chewing their cud, then you know they're healthy. Because a healthy ruminant means a healthy rumen. And if they're unhealthy, they will quit chewing their cud. That's one of the first signs that I look for. And then, of course, I don't want to see any limping animals. Uh, I want to see a smooth hair coat. Now, Kiko goats, for example, tend to have rough hair coats. But there's a difference between that normal roughness of a hair coat and a rough, unkempt hair coat because they aren't caring for themselves and they don't feel good. So you just have to learn what the difference is on that. Uh, I don't want them to be overly thin, but I don't want them to be overly fat either unless it's a finishing kid or a finishing lamb if it's ready to eat. And then I don't want to see any lumps, which is or can be a sign of caseous lymphadenitis or CL, which is a disease that um, can be a problem, although it's usually not as big a problem as many people make it out to be. Good confirmation, we want sound feet and legs. Uh, once again, that goes back to limping. Uh, good body capacity, deep and wide. I'm raising grass-finished animals, so I want them to have a big room and capacity so they can take in all that forage and turn it into meat. Uh, bite correctly aligned, this is mainly a problem with boar goats, more so than any of the other breeds of goats, and much more of a problem in, in those than in sheep. Uh, don't want a parrot mouth, which is what you're seeing over there on top. Uh, because then they can't, they can't eat well. If they can't eat well, then they're not going to gain weight. And that's a genetic thing, and so they will pass that on to their offspring. Sound udders, Mike talked a little bit about that with the sheep today. Um, it can also be a big problem, once again, with the boar goats. They tend to have a lot of multiple teats, uh, most of which are blind, and so you have to be really careful with that too. And then good teeth. Uh, I'm, I've got a good friend down in Louisiana who is a retired small animal vet, and so she talks to me on a regular basis because she's got sheep now, and uh, she'll be the first to tell you that she doesn't know very much about sheep. She knows a lot more than she lets on. Uh, but she just went through her whole sheep flock for the first time in five years that she's owned them and found out that a lot of her old ladies had no teeth left in their heads at all. And because she kept wondering why she was losing so many lambs this last year and why so many of her sheep were so thin. Well, after she mouthed them all and found out they had no teeth, then she had a, a good clue as to the reason for that. So mouthing your, your animals on, on a yearly basis is a good thing because then you're going to know how many of them may be having difficulty eating. And once again, if they're out on pasture, it's much more important for them to have a good set of teeth than if they are eating some kind of a concentrated grain because they don't have to chew that up as much as they have to forages. And back again to how were they raised, that's what you want to ask anybody that you're going to buy livestock from. How were they raised and is this the same way that I'm going to raise them? Um, we've talked a little bit about how to inventory your farm and your knowledge. Uh, but these are also questions that you can ask yourself uh, as, you, as you start doing an assessment. And it goes back to that planning like you all were talking about. Uh, decide what your goals are. Decide what kind of resources that you have or what resources that you need in order to achieve your goals. And if you start from that very beginning, then that's going to help you determine what maybe you could raise or what you want to raise. If we're talking about breeding stock, uh, and for most of you in the room, this is what you should be looking at from the aspect of this is what I'm looking for when I go out to buy breeding stock. Not that you yourself are gonna necessarily raise, raise breeding stock, although I will tell you that right now there is such a demand for good quality breeding stock that if you end up having some, you will probably end up having a market for that also. Um, so mainly things that we've really gone over already, but just to reiterate a little bit, usually they're gonna be purebred, um, although they don't have to be. You almost always wanna get a purebred ram or buck, but for a commercial operation, getting crossbred ewes or crossbred does 
can be a good thing. They're a little less expensive uh, and they probably fit most systems better. Good conformation, free of diseases, good condition, a high level of vitality, which is that subtle energy that we all exude, goes back to that alert and liveliness. If they look alert, they look lively, if everybody's out chewing their cud, if they're out grazing, then you know they have a high level of vitality. Uh, look at the environmental conditions because they're as important as the genetics of the animals. And then producing animals that, that can be sold to people who want to manage them the same way. And the reason that I put this last one up is that when it comes to finding good male animals, it can sometimes be hard to find one that has not been fed a lot of grain if you're in a pasture system. Probably more so when it, we're talking about cattle than with sheep or goats, uh, but there are a couple of, uh, Oklahoma and Maryland both have forage-based buck tests, and those can be very useful to find some farms that are gonna raise uh, their goats in a forage-based system. Uh, slaughter stock, on the other hand, producers who are doing this are raising their animals for the meat market. So they have a slightly different uh, set of criteria to, to look at. Uh, they really want to have healthy animals, but, but some of the other issues if you're raising breeding stock aren't quite as uh, critical because you're just wanting to raise a high quality meat product. So it's got to be free of diseases that would affect the weight. Uh, it, those animals have got to finish efficiently and in a reasonable length of time. Now Mike was talking about how they have a 120 pound animal in five months of lamb. Well, I'm doing grass-based lamb and this year I had the best year ever and I had some lambs that were minor katahdin, which are not going to be as heavy ever as a wool breed, which is what Mike raises. But I had some katahdins that weighed 90 plus pounds in seven months on just grass. That's the best I've ever done. So it can be done, but I've had to cull, I've had to work on my pasture management, uh, and I was also very lucky with the weather this year too. Um, and then finally, no drug residues. And I will talk more about this, but this is my one soapbox issue. I don't know how many of you are aware, there's starting to be an awful lot more talk about antibiotics being banned in farm animals, completely banned, because of the, um, the resistant bacteria that are affecting humans. And we do not want to be responsible for letting any such bacteria in our food supply. And so that's every single one of us. And when you're talking about sheep and goats, there's not very many drugs that are labeled for use for sheep and goats, particularly goats. And if you use a drug that is not labeled for that species, unless you have a valid veterinary client-patient relationship, that is illegal. And if you sell an animal that's got drug residues and it's tested, they will trace you down. And so it's very important to be very careful about what you use in livestock that are gonna be sent to the meat market. And that includes pet animals, that you're not ever going to sell, but then something happens and you end up having to sell them and they go into the meat market. So I know it, it's a really serious topic, but that's because it is serious. And there are times that we do need to have antibiotics available for our farm, farm animals. And so we wanna still retain that ability to have them. Um, Breeding stock breeders have a responsibility to produce and sell animals that are free of infectious, contagious diseases. Now, there are some things that are going to be present regardless, and parasites is one of them. Uh, I would never sell a sheep to anyone and try to tell them that they don't have any worms in them at all because that would not be true. That they are pretty ubiquitous, particularly in this part of the country, and so people have to be aware of what they might be coming into contact with. Also, I have known of cases where producers were so diligent and had such a closed herd that their animals have never been exposed to things such as foot rot or sore mouth. And that is all well and good.
but then they sell them to somebody else who then may bring in other animals that do ha have been exposed to that before, may be carrying a little bit of that, and those animals that have never been exposed to it really, really get badly affected from it. So it all has to do with the amount of exposure, the amount of immunity that the animals have. So while I'm saying that it's a breeding stock producer's responsibility to have healthy animals, the biggest thing is for them to just explain that, yes, I've had this before, I've not had that before, so that uh, a potential customer knows what they're getting. Um, Whereas commercial producers, they must simply produce animals that will have an acceptable carcasses, a carcass with no evidence of disease, anything that would um, mean that that carcass might be condemned. And these different goals mean differences in production systems. So once again, to ensure good health, vaccinations, good sanitation, and then culling animals that would affect the, product, the profitability of uh, commercial producers. Now then let's talk a little bit about vaccines. These are all the list of vaccines that are available for sheep or goats. Uh, the caseus lymphadenitis vaccine, uh, which is case back, is actually only labeled for sheep. So you're supposed to get permission to use it in goats. Um, some goats will have a really severe reaction to that vaccine. That's why it's not labeled. Uh, Clostridium perfringens C and D and tetanus, that's the most common one. And that's what I recommend to new producers to vaccinate for. By doing that, uh, the Clostridium perfringens is also known as overeating disease. Uh, and then of course tetanus. Um, by doing this, it's, it's inexpensive and it gives some insurance to that producer that they won't end up with those diseases. Uh, sore mouth is a vaccine that is available. The problem with the sore mouth vaccine is it's a live virus vaccine. So the t first time that you vaccinate for sore mouth, you're gonna have sore mouth on your place from then on. So I don't really recommend that to people unless they're going to be showing their animals. They're gonna have a very open herd or flock to where they might be exposing those animals to sore mouth on a regular basis. Uh, foot rot vaccines are available. They are not 100% cure-all. They're expensive. And so most people are not gonna vaccinate against foot rot unless they've had a really big problem with it. The big advantage of the hair sheep is that they don't seem to have the same incidence of foot rot as the wool sheep do. I don't think I've really ever seen a case of foot rot in any of the hair sheep I've been around, and I treated foot rot all the time when I was in private practice. But that was before the advent of the hair sheep. Uh, and then the abortion-causing diseases. Um, once again, most people don't vaccinate for those until or unless they have an abortion storm that's caused by one of those. And the big ones are Vibrio and Chlamydia. There are advantages for vaccinations and there's disadvantages. And most veterinarians will talk to you only about the advantages, but I want you to be aware of the disadvantages also. The advantages, of course, it helps to prevent disease and they're inexpensive. Um, one dead animal can pay for an awful lot of vaccinations. And then the marketability of animals may increase. Now this is not as commonplace with sheep and goats, although Mike may have that uh, with his contract that he's got up in Minnesota. They, the market building may be improved somewhat if they're buying any animals in. But in cattle, this is a very common thing that uh, people will get a little bit higher price for their calves if they've gone through some sort of kind of preconditioning program that includes a certain set of vaccinations. But the disadvantages are that every animal is going to respond a little differently and some animals won't respond at all. And so if they don't respond at all, then the producer feels like, oh, well, I vaccinated everybody, I can just do whatever I want to. Usually what ends up happening is that sanitation falls by the wayside and that's when they may end up with some diseases from being in an unsanitary condition. Uh, and then occasionally you can have adverse reactions too. I've never had that many. I think I've only ever had to give epinephrine to two animals that I vaccinated. So, and I've vaccinated several thousand. 
Uh, it gives that false sense of security, which I was just telling you about. Um, and there can be some immune system effects, but that doesn't happen very often in, um, in our food animal system. The vaccination rules are to use the ones needed on your farm. While I feel that vaccinations are very important for food animal producers, I don't, I don't believe in them so strongly that just because there's a vaccine out there, it should be given. I have known producers who very proudly told me they vaccinated for 20 different things. You are still injecting a foreign substance into that animal, and that animal has to mount an immune response to it. So that in and of itself is a slight stress on that animal. So find out what the diseases are in your area and then vaccinate for those and those only. Follow the instructions. Those instructions are important. That's what ensures that you get the immunity. And people all the time ask me, so how much of this should I give? I don't know. Every, every single bottle or every brand, every company has a different dosage schedule on it. And you've got to read that label. You know, usually it's five cc's the first time, two cc's the second time, but it might be something totally different. And boosters are very critical. When you first give that first vaccine to an animal, if they've never been exposed to that at all, they give you, it gives this much immunity. That's all that animal can mount. That booster is what actually gives you the spike of immunity that then provides the protection against that disease. So if it says to boost them within four months, three months, a month, and you are a year later, then you might as well start all over. Now true, during that time, those animals may have be, been exposed to something and they'll go ahead and mount a response, but it's very, very critical to give that booster to get that full protection. And then handle them carefully. If it says to keep refrigerated, you do not want to have that vaccine, vaccinate all your animals, and then throw it into the, to the front part of your truck and drive around all day when it's 90 degrees out. You might, if you do that, you might as well throw the rest of that bottle away because it will not be any good. And once you, some you reconstitute, and if it says use within 48 hours of reconstitution, and you've got some to vaccinate a week later, start all over because those vaccine, those virus particles will die and you will not get the protection that you want. And you'll have that false security because you're thinking I'm vaccinated, therefore they're protected and in reality you haven't. So, so really follow those directions. They're on there for a reason. Uh, sanitation, we've probably talked enough about that. Um, but there is a stress of unsanitary conditions, mud and wetness. When, when an animal is muddy, their intake goes down, but their nutrient requirements go up. So then it's a double whammy. But it all has to do with the duration of that mud. Because yes, our animals do live out in the real world, and they are going to live in mud at times. But we just need to be aware that, okay, they've been in this particular area for four days, and it's just getting muddier and muddier and muddier. I'm going to see if I can move them to another area. Instead of just forgetting, and I'm sure there's not a one of you that hasn't driven by some farm somewhere that sees cattle standing knee deep in mud around a hay ring that has just had one hay bale put in after another on it, and it's just building up and building up and building up. Uh, well, the 30% is actually when the temperature starts falling. I don't know that we've got any hard data on how much the... What's, he might have been. He might have been. But it does. The, the, yes, the nutrient requirements go way up when they're standing in mud. And they've done the research on cattle and sheep and goats are surely worse because they hate mud more than cattle. That's right. That's right. Particularly the goats do. Uh, newborn care that everyone needs to be aware of when they're first starting out. The number one thing, make sure that kid or that lamb nurses. And I will, I will stand and watch to make sure that they nurse. 
um, because a lot of times they'll go up and they'll try and try and try and depending on how nervous that mother is, they might not ever nurse and they need to nurse as soon as possible. I like them to all nurse within an hour after lambing or kidding. But they sure need to nurse within about 12 hours. And so if you see them and they're not, and they're not nursing, uh, you need to keep an eye on them for the next couple of hours. And one thing that, that you can do too if you go out and you find somebody has already lambed or kitted and you weren't there is pick them up and hold them underneath their stomach and put your fingers. If you can touch your finger, if your fingers can touch on either side of that animal, it is probably not nursed. If it's got any colostrum in it at all, you will not be able to touch your fingers together. So that's the, the way to tell if an animal has nursed. Because that colostrum is the first milk and it's got all the antibodies from that mother that will protect him or her for the first six to eight weeks of life. So if they don't get that colostrum, they are much more susceptible to disease. Um, I like to go ahead and ear tag mine. Now there's some people that aren't going to ear tag, depending on how big they are, what their uh, method of production is. I like to ear tag because I like to know who belongs to who. That's how I keep my records. Castrate, now you can't usually castrate a newborn uh, buckling or ram because their testicles are too small, but I like to do it, hopefully I like, I get it done before they're a month old. I won't say that I'm 100%. Mine is also a work in progress all the time. Uh, these are diseases to be aware of, and I'm not really going to go into them here because I really want to focus on parasites. The most important disease of sheep and goats, especially in the south, and I will tell you right now that if you do not have a parasite management plan before you start out, you will not be in the small ruminant business for very long. I cannot tell you how many goat producers I know who are out before five years because they end up losing an entire kid crop to worms and then they sell all the rest of their goats. Uh, and the problem is the dewormers have lost their effectiveness because the worms have developed resistance to them. There are a few that are approved for use in goats, a few more that are in sheep, uh, Panicure, Safeguard, and more tell are the ones that are approved for use in goats. You've got to use a larger dose for goats than in sheep or cattle because it moves through them so quickly and they metabolize it so quickly that it's not in their system long enough uh, to have enough coverage of the worms to kill them. We want to administer it. When I deworm an animal, I either use one of those syringes that's got the silver tip that's kind of curved so I can get it over the back of the tongue, or else I take a syringe and I stick it as far back into the mouth as I possibly can. By doing that, we close the area in the rumen that closes when they're first getting colostrum. And it, it sends all that dewormer straight into the abomasum, which is where the worms are. And that's what we want to happen, have happen. Otherwise, it ends up in the rumen, and then it has to go through the omasum before it gets into the abomasum, and you don't get as good a dosage. So that's an important concept uh, that the parasitologists have learned. This is particularly good for goats, <coughs> but it can be helpful for sheep and that is to hold animals off feed for 16 hours, then deworm, and then keep them off for 12 more hours. Now you've got to be careful if you've got really late pregnant animals or if you've got dairy goats where you're trying to milk them. But if I've got dairy goats, I will milk them, feed them right then, then I do not feed them again or I keep them in a dry lot until right before the second milking and then I will treat them, and then I'll milk them. If I can hold them off feed during that time, I will. But what you're wanting to do is to empty out that stomach as much as possible so that the dewormer goes ahead and is coating all of those worms. Um, one of the recommendations is to deworm 12 hours apart, and this is from a veterinarian. Um, things have certainly changed in the last, what, eight to 10 years, David, uh, with the way the dewormer resistance has increased. And so um, 
veterinarians will say things that uh, we would never dreamed of saying before. Um, the blocks, I don't like those blocks at all because the animals who need them most probably aren't licking them at all. And then they're getting a very low dose and all that does is increase the resistance because one of the big ways that these worms develop resistance is having a low dose that doesn't kill all the worms and then the worms that are not killed, then they survive and they have, they develop a genetic resistance to those dewormers and then they're the ones who replicate and they're the ones that reinfect other animals and then you just make the, the, the process worse and worse and worse. Um, deworming in water is once again the same thing. They don't drink enough so they don't get what they need. Um, Keep off the pasture for 24 hours uh, to keep those pastures as clean as possible, although that's not always the best way of doing it either um, because then the worms that survive that are resistant to the dewormer, they're the ones who shed their eggs. Uh, observe the withdrawal period before selling once again. And if it's not labeled for use in that animal, then you've got to talk to a veterinarian to get permission to use that or to find out what the withdrawal period is. Don't ever use porons as a poron. Give it orally, and now there's more oral dewormers. Um, don't inject them. Oral is the best route. So no matter what you hear otherwise, oral is the best route. Um, we've already talked about this a, a little bit. Once again, I just want you to be aware that if you go to the feed store and you buy something and you give it to your sheep and goats and it does not say label for use in sheep and goats, you are using it illegally and you are the one that's liable. There are several different classes of drugs of the dewormers and I just want you to be aware of what they are. The benzabenazoles are the first one, that's Panicure Safeguard, uh, Synanthic, Valbazin, <coughs> Um, the valbasin also kills uh, liver flukes, which we don't really have a problem with in Arkansas. I have a problem with it along the Gulf Coast, so Louisiana, East Texas. Uh, but any area where there's bodies of water or there's a lot of wetlands that these animals might be in, where there's snails, because it's got to go through the snail it's an, as an intermediate host. Uh, Valbazin, you can't give to animals that are in their first trimester of pregnancy because it can cause abortions. And probably most of the worms in this area are resistant to all the benzimidazoles. The next group includes levamisol, and Morintel is also in this uh, group. Uh, the Morintel is probably the least effective dewormer. Uh, even when all the worms were, were uh, susceptible to it, you still only usually got about a 75% kill using Orintel. But it's very safe, very safe, and so that's the good thing about this. That overdose can kill is on levamisol. And I always tell producers to overdose a little bit with all the other dewormers to make sure, because most people tend to underestimate how much their animals weigh. And so if I tell them to overdose a little bit, then they might get the correct dose. But levamisol is the one thing I will either weigh my sheep or I will have people use the weigh tapes on goats, but I tell them to be as accurate as possible because levamisol is the least safe drug that we have for deworming. Uh, it's one reason why it lost favor was because ivermectin came along, Safeguard came along, they were much safer and easier to give, and so people started using them more. As a result of this, levamisol is the only dewormer that some people have that's effective. It also turns out to be the only dewormer that the worms lose the resistance to it. So if it's not used for a few years, it will work again, whereas the others, that resistance never goes away. And finally, there's the, uh, the abermectins which includes Ivermectin, Max, Epernex, Cydectin. Um, that's also good for the lice, for ticks. Uh, but once again, many, many of the worms are resistant to all the Ivermectins. 
Cydactin is the one that does not affect dung beetles, and so that's something else to keep in mind if dung beetles is something that you're trying to look for. Am I doing something here that's making that fuzzy? I can hear a lot of static. So when do we want to deworm? Well, we need to deworm when we want to salvage an animal's life. And I will just tell you on my own farm, I have not dewormed any of my ewes for five years, none. I've not needed to. I have done culling. I use rotational grazing. I have cattle that graze behind the sheep so the sheep are not ever on the same pasture that only they were on. So I have a sheep cow sheep cycle because sheep and goats have the same parasites, but they have different ones from cattle. They have different ones from pigs, which have different ones from chickens. And so using multiple species of any of those except for sheep and goats will help break the parasite life cycles of all the others. So by doing that, I have really cut down on the amount of worms problems that I have in my lambs too. But when I have a wet, a wet period, if I'm not really religious then about rotation of grazing, then I, end, I always end up. I, I didn't have any worm problems in any of my sheep at all until October this year because we had such a dry summer. It rained in August, but I was still, I was really religious about the rotational grazing. But in October, we'd had another, a really dry September, and I didn't have as much pasture. And so that was when I ran into problems was in October. Um, so, and when I do that, then I use, I use Safeguard because the Safeguard does not kill all the worms, but it does kill some of them, and it also shocks the rest of them. And I put them on really good pasture, and my goal is to um, get that animal having good nutrition so that they can help counteract the worms themselves. I do use Levamisol if I've got an animal that's at death's door. Yes, Jim? Which species were you having problems with in October? Or the sheep? Yeah. Yes. Which, which worm? Species worm was it? Barbara? Well, I'm sure it was Barbara Cole, yes. Yeah, they were, my Flamacha scores were fours. So, this is one of those things you do as I say, don't do as I do, and I'll explain why I don't do some of these things. Um, I'm going to skip through a lot of this stuff because uh, this is really a FAMACHA training here. Um, and and I, just, I just want people to understand that if they don't need to deworm animals, I don't care what stage of production they're in. I don't care what their pastures look like. I don't care about anything at all except the fact that they don't need to deworm them because you want those animals to keep having susceptible worms in them. Um, so what is dewormer resistance? It's any dewormer that is no longer killing 95% of the worms when it's administered. And you can do fecal egg counts to determine how many eggs per gram of feces your animals are shedding, and you want that number to go way down after you deworm seven to 10 days later. Um, and so I said that I use Safeguard. Well, I figure I might be getting a 30% kill, for example, instead of 95%. Can I put some up there? You certainly can. Can you do a herd evaluation by getting several samples? You certainly can. At one time? Yes, and I've got some slides that talk a little bit about that, because yes, you can. Um, and. When I find fecal egg counts are good is to, is to get that baseline of your whole flock or herd. And so if you can do, if you can do even 10% of your herd or flock if you fecal egg count on and then graph that number because the majority of the worms, probably 80% of the worms are in 20% of your herd or flock. And so if you can identify that 20% that's got the most worms and is thus shedding the most eggs, and you get rid of them, you will change practically overnight the amount of worm problems you have. It's very hard to get people to do that, but those who've done it just see a big change. That's what I did. I had my sheep for three years. I was building up the numbers, and then I finally got to the point. And so 
I, I've never had to deworm any of my ewes. My ewes did have enough uh, resistance to the worms, so I never had to do that. But any of them that had a lamb that I had to treat, they were out the door. Any of them that had singles, they were out the door. But mainly I was looking at my worm problems because I had a few more worm problems, but that was because I had bought, I had bought sheep from a flock that I had worked with a lot, and they were their calls. So I knew what I was getting because I had worked with this flock for so many years. So I knew I was inheriting some problems. Uh, but because of my management, I kept my problems to a minimum. But I finally reached that number that I needed that then I could start calling my bottom enders. And that was one of the criteria was who have I, who have I had to deworm, who are their mothers? You know, I don't really talk about tapeworms when I talk about parasites. I usually talk about it separately, but I took all the tapeworm slides out. Um, I don't worry about tapeworms, and I know some people do, and I know there have been instances where, um, in talking to other veterinarians about particular animals, we all agree it can't be tapeworms, but it looked like it was tapeworms. Um, you can see them, but they, but they are in the small intestine, floating around, and they absorb the excess nutrients. So animals have probably going to be heavily parasized with other parasites that are actually causing the problem. So people will go ahead and treat for tapeworms, which yes, you have to use one of the benzaminosols, that's the only thing that works, and you usually have to give it three days in a row to kill that tapeworm. It's a lot harder to kill. And so then they see all these tapeworms being deposited and they go, okay, I don't have any more tapeworms. Their animals start doing better and they go, it was the tapeworms because they could see the tapeworms. You can't see those barbecue pole worms because they're so tiny. So that's why I don't talk about tapeworms very often because it's usually not that big of a deal. Um, so, and this really isn't true anymore, especially in the South, but at one point it didn't seem as bad, but there are more and more people who have lost lots and lots of animals because they have no dewormer that works. Uh, I have producers that say, I don't have any worm problems. Well, either they're very lightly stopped or they've already gone through a culling, and sometimes it's a self-culling. Sometimes they may lose 10 or 15 animals, and all of a sudden their flock is doing a whole lot better. Well, it's because they got rid of the animals that were most susceptible. And they say, well, I give, I give ivermectin every single year. And you know what I tell them? They might as well pull up a syringe full of water and give them, because that's probably all they're doing. People don't realize that they really have resistance because whatever else they're doing works, or they've already gotten rid of all their problem animals. Uh, but, but this second point is what I am basing on when I give my sheep the safeguard when they're not heavily parasitized, when they're not really showing too many signs. Because I'm killing some of the worms that relieve the disease symptoms, and then I'm doing other things like improving the nutrition, getting them on a cleaner pasture, uh, and hoping that their immune system will take over and take care of the rest of it. Um, and so finally, what happens is that most of the worms become resistant, treatment fails, and the animal dies regardless of what you give. This right here is the reason you do not want to treat animals that don't show any signs of worms. Does that mean they don't have worms? No, they do have worms. But the hope is that the worms that they have in their system are still susceptible to the dewormers. And I realize that when people hear this for the first time, it just turns on its head what you've always been taught. It turned on my head what I was taught in vet school, that if you have worms, you treat them and you kill them all. But that's not the case anymore. We actually don't want to kill them all. We want to keep the worms alive that are still susceptible because our goal is to dilute out the resistant worms as much as possible because we are on a losing battle. And so we're just trying to prolong that war as long as possible. So by not treating all the animals, then we're, we're using selective treatment. 20 to 30% of the animals harbor most of the worms. We want to identify those. 
Those are the ones we're going to treat because we want to cut down on the number of eggs those animals are shedding. And then we're also going to cull those animals too. And this right here is just a graph that shows the fecal egg counts of a herd of goats. Uh, and the majority of those goats are in that third of the, of the uh, herd. And so if we treat those, then we go ahead and we get rid of a lot of the worm problems. It completely changes the, the fecal egg count numbers. So then you're, you're getting 1,800 instead of 20,000. And that's what's good about doing fecal egg counts. People don't need to do fecal egg counts on every animal. They don't need to do fecal egg counts year after year after year. If they do them on a, for a couple of years, if they could do it on every animal, first of all, that would be great. Uh, it's relatively inexpensive to do, but it does take some time. You actually have to get samples from every animal. Uh, and then you can identify the high egg counts. You can do, deal with that, and, and you, can get, you can just get a baseline. It's also good if you want to see if your dewormer is working, you take fecal egg counts, you treat, and then seven to 10 days later, you do another fecal egg count. And if you don't get a 95% drop in the fecal egg count, then you know you're developing some resistance. And the big thing right here is for you to know that there is a FAMACHA test. How many in this room already do FAMACHA scoring on their animals? Okay, about half of you. So uh, this is the most beautiful test in the whole world because it's very easy to do if you've got the little card and you understand when to use it. And so it's not near as time consuming as doing fecal egg counts. And it's just a matter of checking the conjunct conjunctiva, the pink part of the eye. So you're comparing the pink part of the eye to this chart right here. The pinker they are, the less anemic they are, and the less likely they are to have homonchus contortus, which is the most disease-causing worm that we have with sheep and goats. It was developed in South Africa. The test was brought in to the University of Georgia, but it was brought in to the University of Georgia with the understanding that producers would not get the card without the training, because this card only works for homonchus contortus, but it's not the only worm that affects our sheep and goats. It just happens to be the one that sucks the most blood and therefore causes the most illness. So you have to use it in conjunction with other things such as fecal egg counts or the overall condition of the animals or the time of the year. Uh, you can't just use it by itself. And so we're looking to see how much anemia the animal is showing and uh, that picture's covering it up, but that's where it says the primary parasite, which is homonchus contortus. So if you use this particular test to determine who you're going to treat, then you will quickly see that the number you have to treat is going to be much less than your whole flock or herd. And as you do some management strategies and you do some culling, then the number that you treat ends up being less and less. So for example, this year I treated three lambs which is the fewest I've ever treated. I would like to say I don't ever have to treat any at all, but this is the, the lowest number, and that's out of about 100 lambs. And in previous years, I've usually, I never, don't think I've ever had to treat more than 10 lambs. So that's, that's all I do. And so to do this, you have to go to a sanctioned training workshop you have a list of resources in your packet, and one of those is the American Consortium for Small Ruminant Parasite Control, and it has a list of workshops that are available. Uh, I know that, uh, that Jim is a trainer. David, are you a trainer? Okay, and so uh, Joan Burke at the ARS Experiment Station in Boonville is one of the researchers who did the research on this FAMACHA test. So in Arkansas, you've got a lot of opportunities to get training if you want to. And then you get, you get a certificate, you send that certificate in to the University of Georgia and they send you that card. Um, yes? Yes. But I do them on request. Okay. So if you've got a group of producers who would like to have a workshop done, you let me know. Mm -hmm. I'll set that up. Okay, great. Thank you. This is just showing you how you use it, but this would you would get this in a in a sanctioned training. 
Uh, this right here is just a <coughs> to show you an animal but without the eyes. I, I don't even know why that picture is cut off like it is. It shouldn't be. But this is a goat that's got low vitality. You can see that her rumen is empty. can't really tell that very well, but she's very thin. Uh, she's standing there in a lot of grass. She's not eating anything. And these are the kind of things that you want to be looking at uh, with your own livestock, and then if you go out to buy livestock from someplace. So we talked a lot about parasites uh, because I wanted to make sure that everybody understood how important that is to know about parasites and how to manage them. Um, but it all goes back, in my opinion, to good nutrition, and that is one reason why I know I don't have as many problems with worms is because my animals are on good nutrition, uh, they're on good pastures, uh, I feed good quality hay when they need it, I lamb at times to where when it gets to be heavy worm season I don't have as many problems because my lambs are older and their immune system is a little bit um, more mature and they're able to handle it better. And so the important thing to do here is to look at their physical condition. That's going to tell you what kind of nutrition you're giving these animals. Um, and if you notice those pictures that Mike showed, those lambs, I mean, talk about fat, sassy lambs. Those, don't, those lambs don't have any worm problems at all. But this is what you're wanting to understand is that they need to have good body condition. And then observe their feeding and grazing. That's going to tell you whether or not you're feeding them what they want to eat. And this is particularly true with goats. Um, a number of years ago, I had a group of producers who were here in South Arkansas raising goats, and they said, our goats are doing terrible. We're just having all sorts of health problems, but we've got all this beautiful Bermuda grass. Well, that was the answer right there. Goats don't think that's beautiful Bermuda grass, except for laying on. And so it might have looked great, but the goats weren't eating it. The little bit they were eating, they were picking up a lot of worms, and so they weren't getting good nutrition, they had too many worms, and they ended up getting sick and died. So go out there and watch. Once again, if they're chewing their cud, then that means they're eating. And this is just how you want to do body condition scoring, which is just your feeling for the amount of fat or muscle cover over the bony parts of the body. So we're looking at the ribs, we're looking at the transverse processes in the loin area, we're looking at the top of the spine, and then the hip bones. And we want them to be smooth like this animal is over here. Goats, unlike other animals, lay down fat internally, so we're really feeling for muscle cover rather than fat cover. And a meat goat, except for a boar, is never going to feel quite as muscular as either a sheep or a cow will. And always remember that goats were never intended to live and graze in a warm human climate. So in this case, goats in a confinement system are going to be healthier, but you are going to end up feeding them a lot more. And I'm skeptical as to whether or not you can make that pay. So in that case, you need, to, you need to plan on raising Kiko, Kiko crosses, some of the other goat breeds, Spanish, that um, have got some parasite resistance. Um, boars, I don't, is there anybody in here raising boars out on pasture? You're raising boar, pure boars? Okay, good for you, well then you've selected. Uh, the forage-based buck tests can never get boar goats on their buck tests because they know they're not gonna do well. They need to be, and we need some boar producers that have raised them on nothing but pasture or predominantly pasture so that we can have some good quality breeding stock that will do well on pasture. So I'm glad to know that you're doing that. Oh, really? Okay, good, good. You gonna do some research on them, David? Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, that is, that's very rare, that's right. Yeah, boars are not good mothers, they have bad feet, and they have no parasite resistance. <laughs> well, good for you, well then, 
I'll start publicizing your name to, for people to go to for breeding stock. <laughs> So to summarize, uh, herd health is really common sense. I don't think I've said anything here that y'all couldn't figure out on your own, but sometimes it's hard to, to think through and everybody gets so bombarded with all sorts of information. Uh, be careful about where you get your information from, uh, who it is that's saying it. There is lots of science behind this. Uh, parasitologists are well aware that there's a lot of worm problems out there. And as a result, they are looking at alternatives. There, there is a lot of research being done on alternatives uh, that I'm sure that no self-respecting parasitologist 25 years ago would have ever even thought about looking at. Um, so there is good information out there, but there's also a lot of junk information out there. Uh, assess your animals, your farm, your abilities, and your knowledge. If you don't know something, don't be embarrassed to say that. Uh, that's what so many of us in this room are here for, is to help you fill in the gaps of your knowledge as much as possible. Uh, if things are going well, then fine tune it a little bit, but whatever you do, don't mess with success. And regardless of what anybody tells you, if what you're doing works for you, even though there's probably, there may be no rationale behind it, I shouldn't say probably, but there may be no rationale behind it, do not change. Uh, Go with what you're doing. If you want to try something a little different, do so. See how it works. That's what that planning, monitoring, and then replanning is. This is where I like people to spend their time. The bottom of the pyramid, soil life and balance, their pastures and grazing management. If producers spend their time on these things, providing good water, then everything else becomes less important. But there's many, many producers, and particularly beginning ones, who concentrate on the band-aids. They spend all their time on the band-aids. They spend all their money on the band-aids. They spend all their time trying to learn what band-aid is going to work the best. And all you're gonna do is throw your money away a lot of times. So that's the end of my presentation. Are there any questions? I also want to let you know, we have just touched on things today. But there's going to be a grazing workshop and field day on December 10th at, at the Hope Experiment Station. And so I've got flyers up here for anybody who might be interested in finding out more about that, where we will talk more completely about rotational grazing, how to set it up, how to manage your pastures, what to look for, that sort of thing. and I think I've got seven minutes. So, <laughs> so, but that's the reason why I have a whole talk on minerals, a whole talk. It takes an hour, so. When is that? Well, I, I'm actually gonna probably talk about, I'm gonna do a, a two-day workshop in Louisiana next week. I'll talk about minerals there. <laughs> but yes, it's just, you can't cover everything. Just like Mike was saying, he has, you know, he had eight different items that he wanted to cover. So I can talk to you about that individually. I do not use it currently. We are actually talking about using it because we had some calves in 2012 that were born in 2012 that have not done well. I take it personally for myself, so I know, and I've done a lot of reading on apple cider vinegar. We are not big input people. We don't like to spend money, but we have talked about, but we've been talking about it for two weeks now, and we have yet to buy any, so that's that's where we are on it. Do you use it and, and like it? It's awesome. Okay. It's absolutely awesome. I've already grown a pair in the back of a, a goat that I, I, I actually put a bar in the back of a goat Oh, so you weren't feeding it, you were actually applying it. Oh, okay. 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 And if they're down, I give them vinegar and they can I mean, I, 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 Well, I, I've, uh, I, I'm, I'm ready to try it too. It's just a matter of going out and getting it and putting it in the water, so. All right. Uh, yes, ma'am. Are there forages? Because I have read some things that you can 
feed and using the rotational that will help with the worms such as Cerisia lespedeza? Yes. Is that Yes, Cerisio Lespedes is the one that's the most research has been done on. Um, and if you've got it to graze, it's really good. They've also turned it into pellets. They've also used it as hay. The research has all been shown that it's very effective, as long as the animals are eating it. After they go off of it, within two weeks, the egg counts rebound. So it's not killing the worms, but it's keeping those worms from laying eggs. And then chicory is the other one. I did research on chicory, uh, and it was it was effective, but they had to be on it all the time. We the first year we grazed chicory one week out of every four, and while we saw a little bit of decrease in egg counts, it wasn't significant. But when we rotationally grazed them on the chicory all the time, then we saw a decrease in the egg counts. What I do on my own farm is that I planted chicory but it's not a very high stand, and so I just kind of have it out there for them to eat because they've got so much else to eat. And the rotationally grazing, to me, it's just a little bit of an extra. We have a lot of DOC. DOC also uh, has deworming capabilities. I really watch to see when the animals eat DOC. They didn't eat it. It really started growing about three weeks ago. I finally saw animals starting to eat it just last week. So they will eat it now. When I turn animals in to dock in the early spring, I don't care if it's green and growing or if it's last year's dead crop that's got the seed heads. My animals tend to eat every bit of it that they can find. So I believe in nutritional wisdom of livestock. Uh, Fred Provenza, retired professor at Utah State, spent his career doing that. And, uh, and, and he, he definitely believes in nutritional wisdom of livestock, that they know what they need and they will search it out if it's available. If, why don't we ask uh, Mike, Dr. Fernandez, if you would uh, come up, Todd, Charlie, and we've got time for Q&A, and we'll just get our panel experts up here to answer.